Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker and I'm your host. I'm very pleased today. I couldn't be more pleased than to have as our guest, Dr. Nora Volkov. Thank you, doctor, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yes. Dr. Volkov is the director of what will soon be, it's not official yet, but it will soon be, the National Institute on Drugs and Addiction <clears throat> at the National Institutes of Health. NIDA is the world's largest funder of research on health aspects of drug use and addiction. <clears throat> Dr. Volkov's work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a brain disorder. This is a very big deal. Thank you, doctor, for that. She received the International Prize from the French Institute of Health and Medical Research for her pioneering work in brain imaging and addiction science. <clears throat> Dr. Volkov's professional distinction is unparalleled. She is a National University of Mexico City recipient of the Robbins Award for Best Medical Student of her generation. She was chosen as Time Magazine's, one of Time Magazine's top 100 people who shape our world, and Innovator of the Year by U.S. News and World Report. She's one of 34 leaders who are changing healthcare by Fortune Magazine. So I'm just, I couldn't wait to read that because I'm just so impressed with your career. I want to thank you deeply. I've been following you for a long time. I read your blogs. Okay. I read your blogs, I tune into videos whenever I can get my hands on them, and I'm honored that you're on the show. Well, I'm very happy to be here, and it's a pleasure for me to be part of it, so <clears throat> thanks for doing it. Yes. I want, Dr. Volkov, I wanted to begin with something of a, a personal nature. You know, it's obvious to me, and anybody who's been, you know, watching you and following your career, that you're deeply motivated from, from a very genuine um, inner place, that, that you're, you're energetic, you seem tireless, and you seem continuously focused. So I'd like you to share with me and with my audience, what is it that, that called you to this? What is, it, what is it that drives you so? Well, I think that, and, and I think that we've spoken about it in the past, and we always try to get simple answers and to complex issues. And what drove me to the field and my passion is uh, we all have, in terms of personal uh, experiences, also there is a scientific one and then as a physician to my experience as, as doctor and seeing how we basically ne completely neglected individuals with substance use disorder. And to me, um, being taught medicine in a way that made absolutely no sense. And then when I went into psychiatry, this, I was exposed to the same situation where we were not taught how to even screen for substance use disorder, and least so how to treat uh, the substance use disorder in the patients that were being admitted to the inpatient psychiatric unit, most of whom had uh, substance use disorder problems. So this was to me antithetical to anything that that actually speaks about quality medicine. Uh, from the scientific perspective, uh, I've always been fascinated by the human brain mm -hmm. and what is it that makes us uniquely humans and what is it that makes you uniquely as individuals, each one of us. And there is a, a process that I value enormously, which is the capacity that we have for self-determination and uh, the notion that we can make a decision of what we want to do with our lives and carry it through. And yet addiction uh, destroys that capacity in ways that are, are, are really uh, very difficult to understand from the perspective or from the perspe perspective if you have never been addicted, just from observation. Mm. They are extremely impossible. And, and so, but scientifically, this is something that is amenable for inquiry and study. And so I was fascinated by the notion of with, with the advent of imaging technologies hmm. to be able to investigate the function of the human brain when someone becomes addicted and to compare it that of the function of someone that does not have the problem and to try to dissect the, the systems that get engaged that get disrupted by exposure to drugs 
and link them to the actual behaviors that emerge when you become addicted. And then there's the personal element uh, that in my family, on my mother's side, mm -hmm. there is history of alcoholism. My um, grandfather, actually, unbeknownst to me until um, my mother was, was dying from cancer and she told me the story because otherwise it was a secret, mm. um, that my fa her father, my grandfather, had actually had a severe problem of alcoholism and had gone to treatment and relapsed. And in the last relapse, unable to contain the self-hatred by his inability to contain his alcohol drinking, he killed himself. Mm. And this was something that was revealed to me as a secret in, in a way that was very, very devastating. Mm. But the other one, my uncle, my favorite uncle, but apart from everything else, he was an extraordinary man, but he also suffered from alcoholism. And that led him to be uh, rejected by the family in, in ways that, that I felt were basically reflected that stigma that we have for addiction and that notion that we believe that the person is responsible for their act, the mm. penalizing attitude, the uh, assignment of attribution to the disease process to the person. So there was the personal that I had lived through and that basically yeah. uh, uh, did not make any any emotional sense to me. And two, was, was associated with a very strong price in my family of suffering and of secrecy. The second, from the perspective of science, the opportunity that we have to uncover uh, what are the systems that actually enable us to have self-determination. And the third one, which was the one as a physician to, to sort of figure out what is it, what information do we require in order to change a culture in the healthcare system that has neglected and stigmatized substance use disorder. And this was particularly important because by not uh, dealing with it as, a, as a, a, a health condition in the healthcare system, we open the door to perpetuate the criminalization of people that take drugs, which is extraordinarily deleterious and promotes the stigma. So those are the personal, the scientific, and the physician, my professional one as a physician, reasons why I am so passionate about this issue. Yes, a perfect storm has unleashed you know, uh, uh, an incredible career, and we're all indebted to you. First of all, I'm sorry to hear, of course, about your grandfather and your uncle, but thank you for being frank with us about your, your personal life. I really I appreciate that. You know, so the three, on, on three levels, you became deeply motivated to pursue an understanding of addiction and treatment for addiction. I know, I, I guess it was 2010, I think it was the American Society of Addiction Medicine released its definition of addiction that was heavily weighted, there was some genetics involved, but heavily weighted toward brain circuitry. Now, <clears throat> would you care, I, I'd like to just like have an addiction 101. I'd like you to maybe go through that initial definition, dopamine, the dopamine system, inability to inhibit impulses, that. But then in, in 2019, there was this whole level added, which was really um, very gratifying for me to hear. The level of life experience, how life experience can affect one's uh, being prone toward addiction and one's ability to recover from addiction. And then more recently, your recent blog on pre-addiction, I think, is fascinating. Could you could you summarize that, if you could? <clears throat> yeah. So let you first want me to give the one-on-one -on, -one on addiction. And addiction is uh, uh, the situation that emerges when the person has such an intense drive for taking drugs that they actually neglect other activities that are necessary for their well-being, and uh, their urge is so so strong that it's actually leads to this compulsive pattern of drug self-administration with an inability to stop despite very adverse consequences. So if you understand it from the perspective of neurobiology, why is it that a person finds themselves in such a situation? Uh, what the research has shown us is that the repeated administration of drugs 
in people that have vulnerability. And the vulnerability can come actually from have had a very adverse childhood experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we know that adverse childhood experience are one of the, the factors that has the highest contribution to overall addiction. Clearly, there are a genetic components, and like in, for example, in my case, in my family, there are factors that make us vulnerable. And I suspect, like uh, the research is showing, that some of those genetic factors that make us vulnerable are basically allowed, is reflect the way that we may respond to adverse environmental conditions. Mm. So I am not an alcoholic, I don't suffer from any addiction, but also I've been very privileged in my upbringing. Had I been brought, uh, born in a condition of uh, childhood adverse experiences, mm -hmm. I may have been at high risk of becoming addicted mm -hmm. from those two factors. So what is it that these predisposition factors uh, brought by adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. or by genetic itself, how do they impact these behaviors? Well, we know to start with that the reward system, which is the one that motivates our action, is disrupted by repeated administration of mm -hmm. drugs. Mm -hmm. We also know that if you're exposed to stressors, that also disrupts your reward circuitry. And this is fundamentally modulated by dopamine. So dopamine, which is activated by drugs with repeated administration, leads to what we can simplistically call tolerance. So you stop reacting to other rewards that are less mm. powerful. Mm. But dopamine also modulates our frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is what we need in order to make a decision of what is the best behavior for me to do in any given circumstances. And I can choose, this is the best option for me right now, and you come up with a plan to do it. If the prefrontal cortex is not working properly, number one, you're not going to be in a good position to make the optimal decision of what should be the next uh, uh, choice in your behaviors. Mm. And even if you make the right choice, if the prefrontal cortex is not functioning properly, you will not be able to carry it through. Mm. And as a result of that, what you have is a very malignant combination, an intense drive to take the drug because the reward system has been harmed by the use of repeated drug, and the inability to self-regulate or to actually have optimal choices in behavior because your prefrontal cortex is also disrupted as a function of the effects of drugs in the dopamine system. Mm -hmm. So you have very strong urges mm -hmm. to take that drug and a very significant impairment with your capacity to make decisions and carry them through. Mm -hmm. So this is at the essence of the symptomatology that we see in a person that when they become addicted. When these mm -hmm. systems get disrupted, then you are, that explains why even though the person consciously don't want to take that drug anymore, they just cannot stop it. So these are at the basic, basic essence. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and the other aspect that I do want to add in terms of understanding addiction, because it certainly helps us, it was important in ultimately what happened to my grandfather that he ended up killing himself, mm -hmm. is the notion that as the disease process becomes more and more and more severe, you start to isolate yourself and you actually, you lose the capacity of well-being. You start to become uh, depressed and very anxious and, and you start to seek the drug, not, not even to have a good sensation, but just to feel normal. So that enhanced sensitivity to stress and the vulnerability for negative emotions then confounds the picture further, making it harder and harder from people suffering from addictions or from what we now call substance use disorders mm -hmm. to be able to seek help and to sustain the treatment. And, and so the path of least resistance is in a way continue to take drugs. So that is in, 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 a, in sort of a one-on-one -on -one in terms of addiction. <clears throat> Then you asked me the last uh, question, which was, what, how do uh, the concept of pre-addiction and why we are uh, urging this new, new proposal, which is a proposal 
that actually Dr. Tom McClellan, Dr. George Coop, and myself put forth in a commentary that was released, I think it was released yesterday or today. Mm -hmm. But the idea basically was born out of a sort of the notion of, again, copying what other uh, interventions in medicine have done that have been successful, specifically the idea of pre-addiction uh, came from the idea of pre-diabetes that was first instituted in 2000 when the endocrinologists realized that people, there were certain biomarkers that while the person was not diabetic, if there was not an intervention, there was a very high probability that that person would end with diabetes. But on the other hand, if they intervene in these very early stages, they could obviate all of the pathology linked with diabetes. And that's why we basically, and, and, and the, the beauty of it also was that it was recognized as a condition, pre-diabetes, with the advantage then you can put resources in order to cover for the intervention that's necessary to improve the behaviors that will lead you to interrupt the course from pre-diabetes into diabetes. So, so our thinking was akin to that. Can we identify a condition where the use of uh, drugs is actually harmful, but it does not fit the criteria of a substance use disorder in such a way that we can intervene and obviate that transition into a more moderate or more severe substance use disorder with all of uh, its associated devastating consequences. And, and, and to the extent that we can consolidate it, number one, we can have healthcare providers screening and then doing the interventions that are appropriate and they should be reimbursed for you. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we can start to, to in a discourse that we feel open to speak about pre-addiction, this also should help um, antagonize the stigma that still permeates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for addictions in general. I, I read about, I read your, your blog on the subject, and I read also the, the paper that you wrote the blog on. I was fascinated by it. What fascinates me is the continuing evolution of this definition of, of addiction. In two, 2019, when the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine revised its addiction, there were some commentaries that I, I happened to read because I was trying to follow it closely. And in those commentaries, they began alluding to what you're talking about, but in a different way. They were suggesting that the term addiction be solely relegated to late, moderate, and severe substance use disorder. And it's been my experience in the field, and, and tell me if it's been your experience too, that the word addiction began being sort of a, like a broad definition of everything from very mild substance use disorder to the most severe substance use disorder. And in that way, it, it lost its specific specificity. And I've come into contact with many people who, because of that, they see people in early stages of the disease who enter into spontaneous remission, where they make a choice. I had a consequence, so I'm not going to take drugs anymore. And they do it. Some, sometimes those people are defined as people with addiction, so it causes the public to kind of think all people with addiction should be able to just decide not to do it, and it feeds into stigma. Have you, have you seen that? Have you had that experience? Absolutely, all the time, and I think it is also clinically very deleterious because the concept is if when you are, uh, we are putting most of our resources towards the severe substance use disorder. But if you look at it in terms of consequences, now we're seeing, for example, that a very significant portion of people that are suffering from overdoses or from the negative consequences of uh, drug taking, people that could fit the criteria of a mild substance use disorder, are not, um, the, uh, their, their symptoms don't justify the administration, for example, of medications. And so, uh, nor the administration of uh, uh, an admission into an inpatient setting. So they get neglected. Mm -hmm. And there is very little research work that has been done specifically to the mass substance use disorder. 
which is the majority, is the, the largest number mm. of cases. Mm. And it's also the, the early stages of the disease process in which an in, intervention can interrupt it and can save the person's life. But again, we're not putting the resources on it. We're putting the resources in the more severe. And, and so to me, one of the things that was most valuable, that I value the most about the DSM-5 uh, diagnosis for substance use disorder is that they became very explicit about severity, mild, moderate, or severe. Mm -hmm. and, and by doing that, they are opening up the door for us to try to figure out um, what are the appropriate interventions dependent on the severity of the disease condition. Mm -hmm. And so currently, for example, at NIDA, we're funding research to try to understand what is it that the best intervention should be for someone that we would call pre-addicted to opioids or could also fit the criteria, which would fit the criteria of a mild opioid use disorder, where it is not justified to give them methadone, where it's not justified mm -hmm. to give them mm -hmm. buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. So what alternatives are there available that lead to the best outcome? So this is an area that needs research. And it also by creating the evidence one can develop guidelines and then one can get reimbursement for those services. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is why I actually uh, resonated very much with that concept as a means to bring attention to a stage in the early stages of the disease process of addiction. Mm -hmm. And that the, whereas we call addiction the severe substance use disorder, we want to bring attention to that mild substance use disorder which in that definition really is not addiction itself, is the early stages, mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. pre-addiction phase. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that work and I think that's gonna be important moving forward into the future of healthcare for people who use drugs in America and I thank you for that. You know, that, th so what about the present though, Dr. Volkov? When we, when we look at the present, it's overwhelming. I think you use the word tsunami and um, I think you've uh, used the uh, triple wave theory. And then you have Dan Ciccaroni, who, uh, a researcher out in California who's added the fourth wave or the quadruple wave, meaning methamphetamine and other stimulants. Well, we're, we're up against something today in America that you know and I know and my viewers know is just unprecedented. What about that? What about the present? Um, uh, I think it was near 108,000 people in 2021, correct? It was 108,000 people, yes. The equivalent of 35 World Trade Centers in, in one year. I think it's a person taken from us every 4.8 minutes. What, what about that? What, 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 what are people on your level thinking about that? What is your hope for these people who, who are taken from us at such an accelerating rate? What, what, what's, your, what's your opinion on that? <clears throat> well, I mean, obviously, I think that we, um, these, these terrible numbers, these tragic numbers, um, have clearly, in a way, brought up the urgency of the issue across multiple agencies and, and across people that come from very, very different backgrounds. Because it, it cannot be ignored, and it cannot be ignored even with also the, the very high numbers of deaths that we have seen with COVID and tragedy. Uh, both of those issues are very present and right now they account for an equivalent number of deaths. So, but they are very different in multiple circumstances. And yet they do share uh, the element that the individuals that are most vulnerable are the ones that are highest mm -hmm. risk of its mm -hmm. most adverse consequences, which of course is death. The, the, the issue, what it tells us, is that it's not going to go away uh, just by itself that it requires attention and that it requires uh, the interaction and the cooperativity of the agencies. That is not going to be one single approach and solution that's going to solve the problem. But the ability and the capacity that we have to tailor the best interventions to provide the greatest support to people that need it and the communities. Mm -hmm. So we have to stop being so inflexible in many ways uh, that it, in many ways that's the way that we have dealt with addiction in general, either it's total and absolute abstinence 
or nothing, or you basically end up in jail or incarcerated. Those mm. practices have not solved the problem. And in fact, the problem has gotten worse. We also need to embrace the fact that what is going on in our country reflects certain social circumstances that are making people vulnerable to taking drugs. Mm. And as we were discussing about what are the issues that lead you to vulnerability, and yes, we discussed genetics. For you, it's heard me very clearly. It is very likely that the reasons how genetics are basically expressing that vulnerability relates to the environments in which you find yourself. Mm. And I, I, I didn't say it just facetiously. I do believe that if I had been born in with multiple childhood adverse experiences with my genetic background, I could have ended up with an alcohol use disorder. Mm -hmm. And by the way, quite severe. So understanding the social components that are engaged in the trajectory of addiction and the responsibility that we have as a society to face them so that we can provide alternatives and buffer them in ways that are not making so many people vulnerable to drugs and substance use disorders. That would be what I would say that the COVID pandemic along with the uh, overdose crisis is forcing us to look into in order to solve it. I strongly believe absolutely that it is solvable that there are actions that if we implement and we put the resources and we sustain, we definitely can control and overcome the overdose crisis. But we need to put the resources and we need to continue to work together. I mean, here is not that me, I'm the science agency, therefore I'm going to tell you what to do. I build the science such that it can hopefully guide policies so that it can inspire others to take the treatments into the community. And it's been very frustrating to build up evidence of prevention interventions of how to uh, protect children and adolescents from taking drugs that are not being implemented. Mm -hmm. So the evidence is out there, but it's not being implemented. Mm -hmm. So that's to say, why, how do we transform that willingness of putting the resources that are necessary to substantiate the structure to protect people from, from drugs. And, and if they do have a problem with a substance use disorder, to help them, protect them from overdosing and dying and all of the negative consequences, and to help them achieve recovery, because recovery is clearly achievable. And that's a message that I would like to say. Most people, and this is something that people don't really know, most people eventually achieve recovery. The problem is that that can take many, many years. And in the process, they can have very, very negative consequences that mm -hmm. can actually jeopardize their life mm -hmm. and their health and mm -hmm. their families. Mm -hmm. That's why it becomes so important to do um, aggressive interventions. It's just like when you have cancer, right? You, your, your, your physician, your healthcare system does, does not Mickey Mouse around. It just basically comes up with a plan and provides the resources that are necessary. We should be able to do the same thing with substance use disorders. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you're probably familiar with Dr. Ju Nyung Park from um, Rhode Island Brown University. She's written a paper on the social determinants of addiction, more and more people are speaking about this. And that's encouraging to me because I've been in the profession for a long time. I'm in my own personal recovery since 1984. So I've been a student of this for practically half my life. <clears throat> you know, years ago, no one was talking about the social determinants of addiction. They were talking about weakness, moral failing, you know, criminal personality. That, that, was, what, that was what addiction was associated with. So because of people like you and research, like the research that you do and your teams do, the consciousness is slowly raising. But like you, I'm frustrated too, because we know so much, but we don't act a lot on what we know. For me, in my community, what's happening in Vermont today, we're seeing a lot of people die from overdose. We've had the um, highest rate in overdose increase for 2019, 20, and 21. Second to us is Kentucky and then West Virginia. 
very, very sad for my state. We lost 215 neighbors in 2021. In my county, we lost one Vermonter a week, 51 Vermonters in 2021. So this is a state, mind you, where we have widespread uh, use of naloxone, very behind getting naloxone all over the place. We have incredibly uh, very low barrier access uh, to buprenorphine, medication for opioid use disorder. We have fentanyl strips. We have uh, safe syringe programs. We have wound uh, protection kits. We have harm reduction uh, up to a point. But even with everything we are doing, we have, we have recovery centers in every county, open seven days a week, no charge, where people can go and find their pathway to recovery. We have very, very active AA, NA, all over the place. But even with all this, the rate of death is accelerating. So when I look at that, I, I wonder, I, I want to move into harm reduction now, because that seems to be the type of intervention that's designed now for the present to reach those people out there who are in the shadows, uh, suffering from maybe from lives of persecution, early adverse experiences, stigma. How do we reach them, Dr. Volkov? When you think of them, those are the ones, in my view, those are the ones that are dying. A poisoned, unregulated drug supply. That's, that's what they have access to. What, what, are we, what are your thoughts on that? Because I know you think about it all the time. You have to. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I think about it all the time. And I think that uh, in many ways, ultimately, we have uh, certain beliefs and thoughts that are basically fed by the circumstances that we live. And one of the aspects, as I think that you were alluding, that accounts for why we're seeing such a high rise in mortality, including in Vermont, has to do with the fact that the access to um, drug contaminated with fentanyl has just accelerated. And uh, while we had seen a very significant rise of fentanyl since 2016, it was predominantly used to contaminate heroin. And yet now we see that uh, most of the drugs in the illicit market are contaminated with fentanyl. Mm. And this poses particularly high risk, higher risk, because People that are taking opioids, like heroin, have tolerance to the opioids. So even if they take a very potent drug like fentanyl, it definitely absolutely can harm them. But if you have no tolerance, you are mm. certain that it's going to harm you. Mm. You're a very extraordinary high risk, much, much higher risk of overdosing that if you have some level of tolerance. So we are seeing that the very dangerous drugs that currently are out there in the illicit drug market is making people vulnerable to overdose deaths that in the past is not that they are taking more drugs, is that they are getting exposed to more lethal drugs. Mm -hmm. And that is contributing to increases in deaths all over the country and, and the very tragically too, we saw for the first time starting in 2019, a doubling in the number of adolescents dying from fentanyl. Yeah. And, and, and the use of of heroin, the use of methamphetamine, cocaine among adolescents is extremely slow. Low is the lowest that it is that it's ever been. But they do take uh, prescription drugs, and and whereas in the past prescription drugs do have harmful effects, but many of them do not produce overdoses. But now, if they do get their hands on an illicit prescription drug that contains fentanyl, mm -hmm. they are a population at risk for overdosing. Mm -hmm. And this is what we hypothesize is causing the very, more than doubling in the number of teenagers that are dying from overdoses over a two-year period. So fentanyl is changing, it's a game changer at many, many levels. And we need to, as a society, and I think this is where your questions were coming, how do we take that into consideration when determining our action plans mm -hmm. to protect individuals. I mean, obviously, ideally, of course, we want them to reach recovery. But if they are not ready, what is it that we can do to protect them so that they don't not die in the process and they mm -hmm. never, ever get a chance to recover because mm -hmm. they die? Mm -hmm. 
So how can we protect them? And that is uh, whereupon the, and, and the administration has embraced this um, as, as an important target, uh, harm reduction interventions that can help people where they are in their trajectories. Whether we like it or not, not, not every, uh, everyone is ready for treatment. And there are many factors that determine your, your level of readiness at any one given point. But we need to act, I think, with humility and understand that the circumstances of people are very diverse and that uh, there are going to be individuals that no, much, no matter how much effort we, we place upon are not ready for treatment. So how do we protect them? You know, and that's where harm reduction comes to play. <clears throat> You know, so I, I, I think in one of your recent papers, you talk a little bit about that. You talk about uh, fentanyl test strips. You talk about certainly safe syringe programs. There's no doubt about the efficacy of safe syringe programs preventing all kinds of health consequences. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I wanted specifically, you mentioned overdose prevention sites. And I, I know it's a controversial subject. I know there's, the data isn't clear on it. <clears throat> but, you know, you're Nora Volkov, and, 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 and you, you must know a lot about it. You must have an opinion on it. Now, you know that in Rhode Island, legislation has been passed. There are two sites scheduled to, to open. You know that in New York, I had Kaylin C. She's the senior program director at On Point in New York. I had her on the show recently. They have a site in Washington Heights. They have a site in East Harlem. And they have two mobile vans that go into the Bronx, where I was born. <clears throat> so there's, there's stuff happening in America. And the data, the only data we have in America is from On Point, and it's looking good. They've reversed many overdoses. They've had thousands of uses. They've um, decrease the, the public use of, of uh, public injection, the public disposal of syringes. So I, I, I don't think you have research on that yet. If you do, share it with me. But, but just knowing what you know initially about what's happening in New York, <clears throat> what do you think about that? Is there a place for overdose prevention sites in, in America? Let's, if we could just forget about it's kind of impossible, but forget about the Department of Justice for a minute, okay? Just make, make believe that there were no legal blocks to overdose prevention sites. Do you see a role for them in America? Well, I, and, I, and you're asking me and, and my perspective, I mean, because we are a science agency, I guide my answers in terms of data because my own, what, what my own beliefs on these things is not what is relevant. What is becomes relevant is where is the data? And you are speaking absolutely, Vancouver, and we've been funding research to determine the benefits of the INSI site in Vancouver. And it clearly has shown that it is not, they've never had a single overdose test. And they've done modeling to estimate that they basically save approximately 50 lives every single year. Not only that, they are actually, because it's a comprehensive program, they are able to engage people in treatment. Mm. So, and they also have shown that they are not only effective in preventing HIV, but this effect is so large that it actually has reduced the incidence of new cases of HIV in mm. the whole community of Vancouver. <laughs> So the data from Vancouver shows very positive beneficial effects. There is data that has also emerged from Australia, also showing that it has saved an equivalent, they have seen more cases, it started to operate, I think it was in 2000. So it, it, it's, it's at least four years earlier than the site in Vancouver. And they also have not observed a single case of an overdose. And I had called, actually, I called the Vancouver site, it was like uh, three and a half months ago, to find out, because they, Vancouver has also a very serious problem with fentanyl, whether things have changed with fentanyl, where they may have seen overdoses associated with fentanyl. They haven't seen a single one. Wow. None, no wow. one that goes to this site 
has died. They've seen overdoses, absolutely. They've seen many overdoses. They've seen many overdoses, but not a single case of death. And so in that respect, you start to see, well, from the structure that these uh, sites are, are placed in, in big cities, they seem to have very positive effects. Also, uh, these safe injection sites, safe injection sites, safe drug administering sites, mm -hmm. uh, or overdose prevention centers are all over the world. I mean, I'm highlighting Vancouver and Australia because that's uh, where we have the most data. Mm -hmm. But there are at least 100 sites throughout the world that have mm -hmm. been operating now for many years. And what I think is telling is that we're seeing more and more being developed. And I think that it's also telling that in Canada, we started with a site in Vancouver. My understanding is that they have now more than 30 sites operating, not comprehensive like INSIS in Vancouver, but actually nonetheless providing places where people that can administer drugs safely. The question is how much all of that is translatable to the United States. So we have been funding um, the site in New York that opened up to try to evaluate the outcomes. And, and from what we are hearing in New York, they basically have been able to save several people that overdose, which of course is what they are one of the reasons why one um, puts these systems in place, these places in place. So, but we need to, um, now that there are going to be several other centers that are likely to be opening in Rhode Island, in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, in mm -hmm. San Francisco, it would give us an opportunity to understand whether there are differences between these places, depending on the city, depending on the resources provided by um, by these um, safe injectors, safe, like safe injection sites, safe at the overdose prevention centers, um, and the cost associated with them. Because if you, if it's a very comprehensive center, of course, it's more costly. But it, on the long term, it may give you a greater investment because you are providing the treatment, mm -hmm. as opposed to some of these mobile safe uh, places for administering drugs that are less costly but cannot provide all of the services that could benefit the patients suffering from substance use disorder. So there, there is a movement and sometimes what happens is that the practices that work tend to be propagated and, and if indeed uh, it is shown and it is economically sustainable because that has been one of the questions that I, to me is important. I mean mm -hmm. all of the sites yeah. that have been evaluated are in big cities where you have a high, yeah. relatively high throughput of individuals coming mm -hmm. in and out. Mm -hmm. If you build one of these places in a rural area, you can start to see why it may not be optimal because you don't have enough utilization mm -hmm. to justify the cost. Mm -hmm. and, and where you also have limited resources that can be invested on something else. Because that's, that's again, when you're making decisions on how to optimally provide the help that people need, mm -hmm. That is always whether we like it or not. Unfortunately, the issue is we're all working. We're all working within certain budgets, mm -hmm. and we need to within those budgets operate to try to get the maximal benefit. Well, th thank you, and I understand that. And I'm I'm just thrilled that your agency is looking at it and researching it. And I'm you know to hear you speak about it and speak of it in such positive terms is very encouraging to me. I had some statistics from from New York, from Kalen C. This is at six months, so November 30th to June. They had 1,400 participants, 1,400, 24,000 uses. They reversed 350, 350 overdoses and only had to have an ambulance involved five times, and the complications weren't the overdose. They were in addition to the overdose. The... the um, the medical system, the emergency room, the emergency departments have been relieved of like an incredible amount of activity. In each overdose in New York, there's two detectives assigned to each case. Each one of these cases did not need any detectives. So the cost savings in terms of medical, um, hospital stays, uh, 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 ambulances, and uh, police work 
was was phenomenal. So that's just in six months, showing a great uh, cost saving. So so that's very encouraging. But as you're saying, that's that's in New York City. Can that be scaled to a, a rural in, an environment? Namely, Burlington is what what I'm I'm concerned with. My my hometown right here. We have 43,000 people living in Burlington. We did a study of overdose fatalities in the Burlington area. We have a heat map that shows they're very densely um, concentrated right around the Burlington area and where there's a lot of public transportation. So we have a kind of a, a location picked out where what would be optimal for an overdose prevention site. We have uh, the support of the mayor, uh, the city council, the state's attorney, the attorney general, um, and, and countless citizens. Now, in, in the NIH uh, report of 2021, they, they, recommend, they recommend following the American Medical Association's recommendations. And the American Medical Association recommended that there be pilot projects, pilot overdose prevention sites set up where there was support from the community and a perceived need in the community, and that they would be followed in research to see if they work. So in my view, we, we, we had almost one Vermonter die a week in a small area, Burlington or Chittenden County. In my view, <clears throat> If we can raise the, the funds, we should be allowed to implement an overdose prevention center, an overdose prevention site. It should be researched, and we should see whether or not it works. I don't think that anybody should really make an assumption that it can't be scaled to any environment. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see how that could possibly be true. <clears throat> Yeah, no, but you're speaking of what you call rural, and there's rural and rural. And I was thinking, for example, in terms of some of the areas in West Virginia that you basically have nothing, and you have people so far away from one another, and there yeah. is no transportation. It's, so th that's what I was thinking. I, I wasn't thinking of a place where on top of everything else, you have a very, very densely concentrated population where you're seeing the overdoses and that also you've identified a site that is reachable. These are conditions that lead you to believe that you will sustain the use of that facility. And, and, and but, but that's unfortunately not the circumstances in other places that have visited in the Appalachia region, for example, where they actually have difficulty even uh, getting access to teachers and to healthcare, minimal healthcare. So there is, there are areas that are very remote. Yeah. Where this is um, that, that again, they don't. They, they, therefore, there the question is, what is the most valuable intervention? How do we provide the help to those individuals that are in these remote areas, so we can protect them? So, but in what, the way that you describe your community, it seems that it is reasonable to predict that uh, such a facility could be justified and that uh, it could provide uh, the benefits that you're intending to provide, and you, you should research it. Thank you. Thank you. We, we are. And the other thing I think you mentioned, you've mentioned resources a, a number of times, and, <clears throat> you know, believe me, I have no idea on your level what, what it's like, you know, with the, with the limited resources and the amount of work you have to do. However, it's kind of ironic, Dr. Volkov, that, that, that right now, because of accelerated overdose deaths over the past 20 years, we're seeing a lot of money coming into the state. Uh, the uh, opioid um, wholesale distributor um, class action suit, $58 million is coming into Vermont over the next 18 years. The Sackler family, there'll probably be more money coming in through that stream. The Biden administration just passed a one point, what, four, one point five billion dollars, like specifically earmarked for harm reduction. So, I mean, all these allocations are a result of tragedy. And that's what I think is 
ironic. But the fact of the matter is that we have more resources now at our disposal than ever before. My, my fear is that this money will not be spent on primarily on an immediate and efficacious uh, approach to overdose death, but it'll get filtered out to lots of other things because that's just the way it is when funds become available. Everybody wants some of them for good reasons. But I see this right now, this point in history, as, as kind of a, a perfect storm of opportunity. We have a tsunami of death, but we also have a rising tide of resources. The, 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 if we can just focus those resources on the ones most at risk, I think we can get through this point in history and then move on to some of the wonderful things that you've mentioned about prevention and early intervention and early addiction and, you know, intervening earlier in the process and saving lives earlier and saving money in the long term. That's, that's just the way I, um, I see it. Do you have any views on that? Yeah, no, and I wish I could tell you, Jess, you're absolutely right. We, let's focus on these very severe people that we have in order to prevent them from dying. And the reason why I do not, uh, I basically think it's not so simple, is that now, as I was saying at the beginning, we're seeing people dying from overdoses that are not coming with a severe opioid use disorder mm. that may be occasional users mm. of drugs. And that includes the teenagers that we're observing. Mm. That includes uh, the older people that seek out medications in the illicit market because their clinicians are not providing them to sleep better mm. or to actually for pain, and then mm. they overdose. Mm. So we are seeing the complexity of overdose crisis forcing us to see that if we want to decrease and reduce the mortality, we have to tackle both the severe, but also the mild substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. That is not so simple as it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why uh, I, 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 again, and I was saying, we, we need to be thoughtful on strategizing how to maximize the resources that we have so that they have the greatest impact. And while um, money is coming in, what I can, I always look at it in terms of the relative amount of money that is coming to address the overdose crisis versus the amount of money that is coming for the COVID crisis. I mm -hmm. mean, there's mm -hmm. absolutely no comparison. And I do understand that there are differences in magnitude too, to a certain extent, but there's no proportion. Mm -hmm. And in my view, and I basically, very supportive of putting the resources for the COVID. And to me, it has been wonderful to see that vaccines are available to anyone, that, that, that testing kits are available to anyone, that antivirals. And that's the way that we should be dealing with the issue of substance use disorders. Treatment available to anyone that needs it and interventions that are tailored to the situation of the person. And yes, indeed, for the COVID, this is an important, very important mm. component. Let's prevent it. So mm. these aspects are, to me, a lesson on how to basically take a process that we have realized we need to put our heads together in order to give the resources that ensure optimal outcomes. And, and we have not brought it anything close to that with overdoses or with drugs. And, and because I think it is, they are not considered at the same level of importance. Mm -hmm. Addiction as a disease is not considered the same level of importance as infectious diseases or Alzheimer's or cancer. And yet it is, it's devastating. And unfortunately, you know, tragically, this is true. But, but, but we have to end now. I have a, a few minutes. <clears throat> thanks, thanks to you, people like you. I think of John Kelly. I admire John Kelly tremendously. Vivek Murthy. There are others who have really stood up against stigma over the decades. And you're one of them. And, um, you know, I just thank you for your leadership. I, I thank you for your, 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 your piercing analytic skill if, and, and your, 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 the way you stick to it. I thank you for this interview and educating me and my audience. I thank you for your generosity, you know, to give us an hour of your time 
with the kind of schedule you have is just really something that we're all, I'm sure, deeply grateful for, Dr. Volkov. So thank you for your career. Thank you. No, thanks. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and your colleagues. Thanks very much. Thank you.